Hi EFR, I'm here with chapter 12. I'm quite excited to find out what is written in the Magician's Notebook. So this is the story of the Bergamo Brothers, part one. Are you ready? Rested? Alert? Or did you just skip ahead because you couldn't wait? If so, I'd like to point out that, the reading by, that reading by flashlight under a blanket is always a good way to tackle the most difficult and dangerous parts of a book. I'd also suggest you have a snack handy, or some gum to chew, otherwise you might find yourself biting your fingernails until they bleed. OK, have all your reading supplies at hand? Here it is then, the magician's story, in his own words. La storia della mia vita. The story of my life by Pietro Bergamo. Never trust a magician. We use words only to divert your attention. Look at my pretty scarf, we say, so you do not see our sleight of hand when the rabbit disappears. But I'm right now as a man, not a magician, and I promise my story is true. How I wish it were not. For it is the story of the tragedy of my childhood and of a terrible secret that has brought nothing but the misery and the death. My brother, Luciano and I, were born in a small town in Italy in the time between the wars. We were twins, what they call in English the fraternal twins, not the identical twins. A distinction that is very useless, I think. Yes, if you looked at us closely, there were many differences between us like the birthmark on the back of Luciano's neck that resembled so perfectly a crescent moon. But Luciano and I were not identical in our hearts. Were identical in our hearts, sorry. When we turned nine years old, our lives, as they say, turned upside down. A terrible man rose to power in Italy, and our whole family was in danger. Our parents, they were being watched, but they managed to find the passage for Luciano and me on a boat to America. They promised to join us as soon as they could, but we knew that would not be very soon, or maybe ever. It was an awful thing to leave our home at such a young age, but at least we had each other. During the time we were making the crossing of the Atlantic Ocean, we never left each other's sight. As a parting gift, our father, he had given, us to, given to us an old book of the magic tricks and we spent all our days practising the card tricks and amusing the crew on the boat. Every night, as we went to sleep, we fantasised about our new lives in America and how we could become world-famous magicians. Our mother, she had a cousin in Kansas City. We were very excited to be going there because we had heard the story of the Wizard of Oz and we knew Kansas was full of the tornadoes and the adventure. What we did not know, until it was too late, was that her part of Kansas... Kansas City was in Missouri, over the hundred, over 100 kilometres far from the capital of Kansas, Topeka, where we happened to get off the train. It was the night time and we were cold and tired and we'd been wandering through the streets of Topeka for several hours when we saw a marvellous spectacle lit up in front of us, a circus. Alas, having no money, we could not enter the circus tent. The Big Top, as it is called. Circus people have a language all of their own. I've collected a few words in the appendix just in case you decide to run away and join the circus yourself. But we found a flap in the tent through which we could watch the horses galloping, the clowns juggling and even a mangy old tiger jumping through a hoop of fire. What most impressed us was the ringmaster, so magnificent in his top hat and tails. We didn't speak much English but we could tell what he was saying by the tone of his voice and by the screams and the cheers of the crowd. At one point, I could have sworn it was so he saw us and winked at us. It was like as if he knew us, and although we were outside, we were not paid for the tickets, we were the most important audience of members of all. When the show ended, we followed with the rest of the circus audience into, out into the midway. This was an old-fashioned way of travelling. Old-fashioned travelling circus, with all the great sideshow attractions, like a fire-eating strongman. A fat lady with a beard, which we later learned was fake, and a fakir, fakir, actually a white man dressed up to look like an Indian swami. Being amateur magicians, we wanted to look inside all the booths, but the car carnival workers, the carnies, they were watching us like as if they were hawks. 
We had such great hunger that the smell of all the candy floss and the popcorn and the peanuts was almost too much to suffer. Then we spied a food cart that had been left unattended. A row of red candy apples glistened under a string of lights, ripe for the taking. Quickly we each grabbed an apple and darted into the shadows behind the cages of the animals. What luck! But as soon as we sank our teeth in, those apples, they were ripped out of our hands. Shocked, we looked up to see grinning down at us an old carne. He was missing most of his teeth, and believe me, that grin was a scary thing to see. Nice of you to help feed the animals, he said, tossing our apples into the cage of the tiger. Oh no, he laughed, as we watched the tiger swat aside our apples like a cat with a, with a yarn. She don't like apples. Them apples is just to give her the smell. The smell of human, I mean. As he said this, he gripped us by the scruffs of our necks and he made a big show of sniffing us like as if we were the dinner. Then he dragged us towards the door of the cage of the tiger. We screamed and we struggled, but it was useless. His grip was so strong. By now we were crying and pleading for our lives in Italian. We thought truly we had reached the end. Goodbye, I said to Luciano. No, not goodbye, just Arriva Derche, he said, looking up towards the sky. We will be together always. Yes, together always, I said, trying to be brave as be as brave as he was. I touched my finger to the crescent moon of his birthmark and I closed my eyes. Let go of them, Sammy It was the ringmaster walking towards us. Don't worry, boys, that old tiger don't got any more teeth than Sammy does. She couldn't hurt a fly. Eyes twinkling, he said we should know better than to run away like that with the stolen goods. When you steal something, you should walk away slowly, he instructed us. Otherwise, you attract attention. As a punishment for our poor attempt at thievery, the ringmaster ordered us to help Sammy clean the cages of the animals. Very relieved to be alive, we worked so hard that even Sammy was happy with us. The next morning, exhausted but also exhilarated, we were sitting outside the ringmaster's trailer with his three-year-old daughter while inside his wife prepared the breakfast. To pass the time, we took out our deck of cards and practised the tricks, which the ringmaster's daughter seemed to find extremely amusing. We did not know it, but the ringmaster, he was watching us from the trailer. When we finished, he applauded. Lucy knows a good trick when she sees it, he said, pointing to his daughter, we try out all, on, all our acts on her. After Luciano and I ate the, all the bacon and the pancakes, why is it that the food always tastes so much better on the outside? The ringmaster instructed us to help his crew pack up the tents. He never asked from where we came or where we were going. He just assumed that we would be travelling with the circus. And so did we. If you are one of the, one of the lucky or is it the unlucky, people that are meant for the life of the circus, it is as natural as the migrating is for the geese, or as the hibernating is for the bear. After reading that last sentence, Cass closed the magician's notebook. She had to stop reading, not because the story had ended, but because the bell had rung. Actually, it started ringing around the time Pietro and his brother had been fed the ta- were being fed to the tiger, and if Cass and Max Ernest didn't move very quickly, they were going to be late for their next classes. Max Ernest, in an unusually rebellious mood, suggested they skip their classes altogether and continue reading, but Cass pointed out that they might un- attract unwanted attention that way. After all, neither of them were in the habit of ditching classes, so they reluctantly agreed to postpone reading until lunch, when they would re-meet behind the gym. Now the next chapter is obviously the story of the Bagamo brothers, part two. And it should be chapter 13. But the author has crossed out 13 and has put 14. Which is at the bottom. Of course, I don't really believe that the number 13 is bad luck. But under the circumstances, why not play it safe? I'm really intrigued to find out what happens in the next part of the magician's story.